The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. Psalm 27, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that I will seek that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Okay, today we're in Leviticus 25, verses 39 through 55. We're going to finish up the chapter on the year of Jubilee. Verse 39, and if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave. As a hired servant and a sojourner, he shall be with you and shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. And then he shall depart from you, he and his children with him, and he shall return to his own family. He shall return to the possession of his fathers, for they are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. You shall not rule over him with rigor, but you shall fear your God. And as for your male and female slaves, whom you may have from the nations that are around you, from them you may buy male and female slaves. Moreover, you may buy the children of the strangers who dwell among you and their families who are with you, which they beget in your land, and they shall become your property. And you may take them as an inheritance for your children after you to inherit them as a possession." They shall be your permanent slaves, but regarding your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule over one another with rigor. Now, if a sojourner or a stranger close to you becomes rich, and one of your brethren who dwells by him becomes poor and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner close to you or to a family member of the stranger's family, after he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brothers may redeem him, or his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him. Or anyone who is near of kin to him in his family may redeem him. Or if he is able, he may redeem himself. Thus he shall reckon with him who bought him. The price of his release shall be according to the number of years. From the year that he was sold to him until the year of Jubilee, it shall be according to the time of a hired servant for him. If there are still many years remaining, according to them, he shall repay the price of his redemption from the money with which he was bought. And if there remain but a few years until the year of Jubilee, then he shall reckon with him, and according to his years he shall repay him the price of his redemption. He shall be with him as a yearly hired servant, and he shall not rule with rigor over him in your sight. And if he is not redeemed in these years, then he shall be released in the year of Jubilee, he and his children with him. For the children of Israel are my servants to me. They are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt I am the Lord your God. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, 
to the beloved Aphia, our Chippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you. Being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is, my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay not to mention that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Our text verse comes from 1 Corinthians 7. It's verses 22 and 23. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. In last week's sermon, we ended with a passage on lending to a poor brother Israelite. No interest was to be levied on him, and he was to be treated properly in the Lord's eyes. The Lord had redeemed them, and they were thus the Lord's possession. It was therefore ultimately a self-defeating prospect to harm another of the Lord's redeemed. The law would be violated, the Lord would be displeased, and the loss would ultimately outweigh any gain. Further, In causing greater trouble to the poor, he would ultimately have to sell himself off as a slave to another. In such a situation, the law would again require certain things to be done in order to ensure proper treatment of this poor soul. To not follow through with those things would then lead to the law being further violated, to the Lord being more displeased, and thus only greater trouble would arise for those who so conducted their affairs. The Lord wasn't just breathing hot air when he gave these laws, and he eventually followed through with judgment on the people because of not heeding them. Jeremiah 34 verses 17 through 20 specifically deals with the issue of inappropriate treatment of fellow Israelite slaves. The details of what he promised to do are not pretty. Paul, writing to Philemon on behalf of the slave Onesimus, did not appeal to the law of Moses but he appealed to the spirit of the law. What is mandated for Israel was given to show us hints of the greater work of Christ, our Redeemer. The year of Jubilee in Israel points ahead to the full, final, and forever redemption, which is guaranteed to us because of what he has done. In the meantime, though redeemed, we are asked to act in a way which is honoring of the Lord who has accomplished the redemption. Such will be seen again as we finish up this most beautiful chapter on the year of Jubilee. It's all to be found in his superior word. And so let's turn to that precious word once again, and may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. 
I have a couple of thoughts for you today. The first is Israelites as masters. It's verses 39 through 46. Verse 39, and if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor, for the third time in one chapter, the word muk or poor is brought to our attention by the Lord. It was first seen in verse 25, and the context remains the same. It is speaking of a fellow Israelite who becomes poor. The word comes from a root meaning to be thin, and thus it is figuratively applied to one who becomes impoverished. The Lord's attention is on such a person, and it completely dispels the notion that he favors a person because of his wealth, status, or position. How important this is to remember as we sit in church, having come in a nice car, from a nice house filled with our life's treasures, and after having eaten all that we needed before we came. In fact, I probably ate more today than many people in parts of the world will eat in an entire week. There's a feeling of satisfaction in such a state that God must really favor me. This is a dangerous mental trap which belies the truth of biblical favor. The Lord's attention is carefully directed to all of his people, even the poorest, and his favor upon our physical prosperity cannot be equated to his favor upon us as humans living in his presence. So much for the prosperity gospel. You talk about something that is false from the start, that is it. How evident this is from the next words. Verse 39 continues, and sells himself to you. There are several ways that this could happen. Exodus 22 verse 3 showed that a person could steal, and if he couldn't repay according to the law, he could be sold for his theft. In 1 Kings chapter 4 is another example. It says there, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord and the creditor is coming to take my two sons away to be his slaves. Other passages give more details on Israelites who had been sold into bondage. For them, the law has specific guidelines. Verse 39 going on, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave. Lo ta'avo bo avodat aved. No shall you compel in him to serve as a bondservant. These words follow after verses 35 through 38, where the Israelite has already been instructed to aid and assist one who has become muk or poor. There should have already been an effort to stem his poverty, including loans without interest of any kind. Nothing more than what was given, be it money or goods, was to be expected in return. Now, this impoverished person who obviously couldn't even pay back the principal is obliged to sell himself to simply survive. The Lord specifically commands that if an Israelite, he is not to be taken on as a bondservant, meaning as a slave or a servant who works for nothing. The onus is on the richer of the two. If he fails to act as the law requires, then who is it that's out of favor with God? Wealth in Israel is not a protection for the wealthy because of God's favor. It is a responsibility intended for the poor upon whom God favors. As the pulpit commentary says about this state, all alike, master and bondsman, were the slaves of God, and therefore not only were they so far on an equality with one another, but the master would be encroaching on the right of God if he claimed God's slaves for his own inalienably. Verse 40, as a hired servant and a sojourner, he shall be with you. The hired servant's rights have already been outlined, such as the Lord instructing the people to not withhold the wages of a hired servant. The sojourner's protections have likewise been detailed. The Lord expected the treatment of such to be exemplary by the covenant people. In like manner, the bonded Hebrew was also to be treated. He was to be cared for rather than manipulated. He was to be recompensed for his labors, not subjugated and oppressed. In this, the scholar Uller rightly states that through this principle, slavery was completely abolished as far as the people of the theocracy were concerned. Now, what that means is they are actually bonded slaves, but they are not to be treated as bonded slaves. That's the idea that we're getting here. Verse 40 continues, and shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. Those who attack and challenge the Bible at every single word come to these words here and claim that the Bible now contradicts itself. It has already been seen in Exodus 21, verse 2, that a Hebrew servant was to be released after six years of service. This is repeated in Deuteronomy 15. However, this verse says that he shall serve until the year of Jubilee, 
an occurrence only once every 50th year. There is absolutely no contradiction here at all. A bonded Hebrew could serve no more than six years ever. If the year of Jubilee occurred before that, he was to be released, even if it was but one year. The year of Jubilee, which is the highlight of this chapter, was to take precedence over all other such laws. Total freedom was to be proclaimed, and total freedom was to be given, regardless of any other set times. The land was to revert to its original owners. It would thus require the care of that owner, even if he were serving as a bonded servant. With the reacquisition of his land, he would then be able to work towards the future on an even level with every other person in the Hebrew society. Verse 41, and then he shall depart from you, he and his children with him, and shall return to his own family. The family of the bonded Hebrew was his and could not be deprived him. However, in Exodus 21, we have a clarification of this law. If the master gave him a wife during his time of servitude, she was not to go out with him, and any children born to the union were likewise not to go out with him. To understand why this was, you can refer back to that sermon. It is just, it is fair, and it is proper when rightly considered. In that passage, the bonded Hebrew could renounce his right to freedom and remain a permanently bonded servant. As a sign of this allegiance to his master, he was to be brought to the judges first and then taken to a door or a doorpost and the master was to pierce his ear with an awl. In that act, he was bonded forever. The year of Jubilee would not override this sign of allegiance. Every detail of that points to Jesus Christ. If you don't remember it, please go brush up. Other than that exception, however, verse 41 continues, he shall return to the possession of his fathers. In Shnat HaYobel, or the year of Jubilee, the bonded Hebrew was to be released and he was to be granted full rights, including his father's land once again. No government law, no edict of man, and no other arrangement under the Mosaic law could override this. Verse 42, for they are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt, they shall not be sold as slaves. This verse corresponds directly to verse 23, which said, The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine. These two verses form a link and are clues to the intent of the entire passage of the year of Jubilee in chapter 25. The land is the Lord's, and therefore it could not be considered as a weapon against another Hebrew. Likewise, the people were the Lord's, and therefore they could not be mistreated. He delivered all of Israel, and therefore all of Israel was on an equal footing in his eyes. In this, Adam Clark rightly states the following. It was in being his servants and devoted to his work that both their religious and political service consisted. And although their political liberty might be lost, they knew that their spiritual liberty never could be forfeited except by an utter alienation from God. Therefore, verse 43, you shall not rule over him with rigor. Here a word is given that has not been seen since the very first chapter of the Bible, rada, or rule. It comes from a root meaning to tread down. Thus it is to subjugate another. Man was given this rule, this dominion over all the fish, birds, and land creatures. He is also to a point given dominion over other men. But the Lord specifically says that it is not to be with perek or rigor. This is the same word seen only so far in Exodus chapter 1. There it said that the Egyptians ruled over the people of Israel with perek or rigor. As Egypt is symbolic of the world of sin and thus bondage to the devil, we are being asked to look deeper than just a surface mistreatment of one Hebrew over another. In what should point us to the Lord Jesus Christ himself, this word perek is the root of the word paroket meaning the veil which hung between the holy place and the most holy place. The veil thus signified that on one side there is cruelty of life and on the other side there is peace with God. The veil was that point of division. That veil is, according to the book of Hebrews, the body of Christ, which was torn for our transgressions. In his redemptive act, the rigor of this earthly life was fulfilled. And because of this, no servant of his was to be treated in that way. He took upon himself what we are to be exempted from. Verse 43 continues, but you shall fear your God. To fear God is to respect his position as sovereign and to acknowledge both his work for the people with gratitude 
and his right to judge the people with justice. Considering the picture of the veil signifying the rigor which is prohibited to be laid upon the bonded Hebrew, because Christ has taken that from us, the words of Ephesians chapter 6 show that the precept of verse 43 only looked forward to Christ and to his work. Here's what it says. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. And you, masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master is also in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Verse 44, And as for your male and female slaves whom you may have from the nations that are around you, from them you may buy male and female slaves. Permanent slaves could be obtained from the surrounding nations. This could be through regular transactions, conquering them in war, and the like. These would not be released after a set time, nor even in the year of Jubilee. Instead, they became a part of the property of the Hebrew owner. The term, the nations that are around you, excludes any of the nations who were devoted to destruction who are named in Deuteronomy chapter 20, with the reason for their being destroyed. The Lord had been patient with the inhabitants of Canaan for 400 years. Their wickedness had reached its fullness, and they were to be destroyed. However, in the conquest of Canaan, some of those devoted to destruction did become slaves of the Israelites anyway. The most noted example is that of Joshua chapter 9 concerning the Gibeonites. Verse 45, Moreover, you may buy the children of the strangers who dwell among you and their families who are with you, which they beget in your land, and they shall become your property. The Toshav, or stranger among Israel, would be someone who had taken up residence in the land. They were among the Hebrew people, and they had submitted to various requirements, but had not been circumcised or embraced the faith of Israel. They could be bought and sold as property, with no chance of release, unlike bonded Hebrews. However, if they were bought as slaves, they were then required to be circumcised according to the law which was given to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 17, which said, Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house, or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And so, in a unique way, the slaves of the Hebrews were given this unique sign as a way of identifying them permanently with the covenant people. Verse 46, And you may take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them as a possession, they shall be your permanent slaves. The purpose of these words is to show, without any debate at all, that these non-Hebrews were not provided with the rights of the Jubilee. Instead, they were permanent possessions of the Hebrews, even to bequeathing them as an inheritance to the next generation. Their status as slaves was permanent. Now think of Onesimus, who I read about at the beginning of this. He was a slave of a Christian. And he was a permanent slave. But what happened after he was converted by Paul to Christ? Within this seemingly unfair standard, there are still provisions for the slaves, including freedom itself. The slaves were to be treated without excessive force. If this was violated, they could demand their freedom. In Exodus 21, it said this, If a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant and destroys it, he shall let him go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, he shall let him go free for the sake of his tooth. Further, it is implied in Exodus 12 that if any person were to assume the requirements of joining the people of Israel, they were to be treated henceforth as natives of the land. This must apply to the slave as well as to the free man. Great allowances for these slaves are seen and are made explicit in the law itself. Once again, Think of Paul and Onesimus. What is to happen? And you know what Paul wrote. He didn't appeal to the law. Rather, he appealed to the spirit of the law. And he showed that the law itself was giving these examples for us to learn from and to understand. Verse 46 continues, But regarding your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule over one another with rigor. 
These words seem to imply that a non-Israelite could be ruled over with rigor, but we have seen that this went only so far and no further. And more, the same words, rada and perek of verse 43 are seen in this verse. We are being shown pictures of the Hebrews' rights and privileges that are reflective of the rights and privileges of those who have been redeemed in Christ. He is our sovereign and the one who has dominion over us. We have been brought out of bondage to sin, and we are given an exalted status because of it. These people whom you see, each is my servant, whom I brought out of Egypt the land. And so to my word concerning them, you shall be observant. Yes, you shall pay heed and understand. It is I who have redeemed and I to whom they belong. With rigor, you shall not over them rule. You shall not mistreat them, nor do them wrong. Surely over them you shall be kind. Never shall you misrule. And on the year of Jubilee, there shall be a release, final and forevermore. On that day, the riches of heaven you shall see, when at last you are conducted through heaven's door. Our second thought today is Israelites as slaves. It's verses 47 through 55. Verse 47. Now, if a sojourner or a stranger close to you becomes rich, and one of your brethren who dwells by him becomes poor and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner close to you or to a member of the stranger's family, every possible case of servitude is covered in the law, including what is now proposed. The Hebrew here is idiomatic. It literally says, and if becomes sufficient the hand of a foreigner settled among you and becomes poor your brother with him. There is then the sense of one reaching up to wealth while the Israelite becomes low and depressed. In such a case, the Israelite might decide to sell himself off to this non-Israelite, figuring his lot will be better under the stranger's wealth than he will be in his own property. Or he may even sell himself off to someone in the foreigner's family. The word used is found only here in all of scripture, eker, or literally an offshoot. In this case, it is a non-Israelite related to another non-native in the land. He has rooted himself in the land and possibly even among the people of God, having been incorporated into the commonwealth. Regardless of the status of the buyer, if a native Israelite were to take this course of action and sell himself off, then, verse 48, after he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brothers may redeem him. I'm going to tell you what, Christ is all over verses 48 and 49. If anybody watched the Thursday night Bible class, I gave you a bet, $50, that we would have Christ in this sermon, and nobody took the bet, and they were wise. He is all over these two verses. Regardless as to what the non-native desired in this matter, or even his status in regard to the Israelites, if he dwelt in the land, he had no say in this law. The law of a non-Israelite being sold to an Israelite is reversed here. The Israelite slave, like the land of original possession in Israel, was always redeemable. The Lord ultimately is the owner of both, and therefore there was no authority higher than the law which covers such redemption. In this is seen the continued germination of the idea of what Messiah would come to do. Israel had been redeemed, they belonged to the Lord, but they could be sold off temporarily. However, it was never a permanent arrangement. The people could be redeemed at any time by a redeemer. And even if that did not occur, the once redeemed Israelite was still to be given total freedom in the year of Jubilee. This forms a picture of the absolute and eternal salvation found in Jesus Christ. We may be sold off to whatever possesses us, be it drugs or some other addiction, but there is no time that we cannot be bought back from that. And further, Even if we're not bought back, we get into drugs and we spend the rest of our life in drugs. In what is the true jubilee, we shall be forever set free in our final release in Jesus Christ. The brother here in this verse points directly to Christ Jesus, where in Hebrews 2 verse 11, it says he is not ashamed to call us brothers. The temporary ownership of our bodies by the world cannot negate the eternal ownership of our souls in Christ. Because Christ assumed a human nature, we are as brothers in humanity to him. Thus, the brother is mentioned first as a possible redeemer. For now, and in the immediate context, any Israelite could be redeemed by his brother, verse 49, or his uncle, or his uncle's son may redeem him. 
the brother has already been mentioned. But then it curiously goes in this verse to who? The uncle. You think, why would he say that? Why would he specify him out of all of the possible relatives that could redeem him, right? The Hebrew word for uncle, it's written right up there on that thing over there. Ani le dodi ve dodi li. I am to my beloved and my beloved to me. The Hebrew word for uncle is dod. Literally means beloved. Then it says ben dodo or son of uncle. The letters used here form an anagram of Ben David, or son of David. Thus, we have a hidden reference to the Messiah right here. Christ is called the beloved Dodo by Paul in Ephesians 1 verse 6 in a passage where he speaks in great detail of our redemption in Jesus Christ, thus connecting him to the one who can redeem here in the book of Leviticus. He is also called the son of David or Ben Dodo countless times in the Gospels. Ben David, which is an anagram of Ben Dodo. It's the same letters, just rearranged. That's said countless times in the Gospels and epistles. In this, Christ Jesus is again the Redeemer. He is the son of David, descending from Judah. He is the one who is qualified to provide the eternal redemption of the people of God. As John Gill notes, he says, They, through the fall and in a state of nature, are become poor and helpless, and in a spiritual sense have neither bread to eat nor clothes to wear, nor money to buy either, and are in debt, owe 10,000 talents and have nothing to pay, and so are brought into bondage to sin, Satan, and the law, nor can they redeem themselves from these by power or price, nor can a brother or the nearest relation redeem them or give to God a ransom for them. None but Christ could do this for them, who through his incarnation, whereby he became of the same nature, of the same flesh and blood with them, and in all things like unto them is their goel, and so their Redeemer, and has obtained eternal redemption for them, not with silver and gold, but by his own precious blood. Verse 49 continues, or anyone who is near of kin to him in his family may redeem him. The Hebrew uses two words which both essentially mean flesh. It speaks of anyone who is Misha'er Basaro, or from flesh of his flesh. Although nearly synonyms, the first is flesh as in nearness. I am the same flesh as my father. And the second is flesh in substance. We are all made of human flesh. The catch-all phrase here again speaks of Jesus Christ who took on the substance of humanity and likewise through that act came into a family nearness with us in order to redeem us. And finally, there is one more option for this Hebrew slave. Verse 49 continues, or if he is able, he may redeem himself. The question is, how could a person so poor that he had to offer himself as a slave in the first place find sufficiency at hand to redeem himself? The answer is certainly through an inheritance. Therefore, the person hasn't directly redeemed himself, but it has happened through a granted inheritance. This again looks to the work of Jesus Christ. Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 carefully writes out what is the inheritance of the saints. In particular, he says of Christ, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. It is Christ who works, and it is because of his works that we can receive the inheritance. The law again has pointed us to a greater spiritual truth for the redeemed of the Lord in Jesus Christ. I told you, those two verses are absolutely filled with it. And you have to wonder, why would he go from a brother to an uncle? It's because of the words that are being used selectively to show us what Christ would do in every possible instance of this. Now, I had said something that somebody is going to be upset about, and they're going to email me unless I explain it right now. I said a person could get into drugs, and they could spend the rest of their life in drugs, and they are still going to be there at the year of Jubilee, the final release. And you can say, well, how can that be? That's so, that's not possible. They got this legalistic thing in their mind. I will tell you that there are people that go to the doctor and they are prescribed something called opioids. And opioids are addictive. And it's not their fault that they fell into opioid addiction. And as I said, they can get themselves out of that. And that is a picture of one of the ways of being redeemed. But if they can't, if they simply fall into complete opioid addiction by something that was not their fault, the Lord will never reject them because of that. And he will redeem that person at the end. Salvation is eternal despite ourselves. So save yourself the email. Verse 50. Thus he shall reckon with them who bought him. 
The price of his release shall be according to the number of years from the year that he was sold to him until the year of Jubilee. It shall be according to the time of a hired servant for him. What we have here is a calculation comparable to the redemption of property in verses 15 and 16. As the sale and redemption of the land is based not on the actual land, but on the number of crops available until the Jubilee, so the sale and redemption of an Israelite is based not on his person, but on his work and productivity. This does not take into account any speculation either. For example, one can say, hey, our brother here is 62 years old and the Jubilee is 40 years away. We're only going to pay until the average age of death, which is eight years from now, 70 years old, so we're going to pay you for eight years. Instead, the payment is made solely based on the year of Jubilee, regardless of any extenuating circumstances. The favor of the deal goes to the owner of the slave, giving the greatest regard that it was handled in a perfectly fair manner. Jesus Christ is all over that. And isn't this what happened in our redemption? Christ now possesses us. He has given us the guarantee of that redemption in the sealing of the Spirit. And yet, the payment rendered for our redemption, the blood of Jesus Christ was the full amount required, meaning even to his death, to carry us through until the final time of release. We are not partially redeemed, but fully redeemed. No further claim can be laid upon us ever, ever, ever again. So much for loss of salvation. Even in the Old Testament, we have these pictures, how people can miss this and twist the New Testament to say that you're in bondage and you have to do what I say or you're going to lose your salvation and all this crazy theology we talk about on Thursday nights. Even the Old Testament shows us these truths. This continues to be explained. Verse 51. If there are still many years remaining, according to them, he shall repay the price of his redemption from the money with which he was bought. Mm -hmm. The calculation is given in a standard form. If he sold himself for 30 pieces of kaseth or silver, and there were 20 years until the Jubilee when he did so, then if he is redeemed after 10 years, the master was to be paid 15 pieces of kaseth. More years until the Jubilee would mean a higher proportion to be paid, and less would mean a smaller proportion. This is seen in the next words, verse 52. And if there remain but a few years until the year of Jubilee, then he shall reckon with him, and according to his years he shall repay him the price of his redemption. Everything is based on the original sale and the years until the Jubilee. That is the entire basis for redemption. Nothing is said here, however, concerning seventh year Sabbath years. As a slave is not limited to agricultural work, one would logically not deduct those years, which are deducted for land rest each seventh year in the sale of property. Further, nothing is said about the slave being released after six years, which would be the case if he had sold himself to another Israelite. That law of Exodus 21 does not apply to foreign masters, and thus it would be a very strong inducement for an Israelite to sell himself not to an outsider, but to another Israelite. The entire tenor of these laws is given to avoid as much as possible becoming entangled with non-Israelites in such matters. Keep your allegiances to Christ. If you get swallowed by drugs, he can redeem you out of that, whatever. It's all pointing to the same issue again and again and again. Verse 53, he shall be with him as a yearly hired servant. What this means is that he is to be reckoned as a servant who could obtain his freedom at any time and that his time of bondage was for a specified time, even if not sooner. He was never to be counted as a personal, permanent slave whom he could mistreat at will. And to ensure that this precept was held as absolute, verse 53 continues, and he shall not rule with rigor over him in your sight. And the people of Israel were to individually keep watch over such an arrangement, carefully observing that the sacred care of one Israelite over another was not violated by a foreigner over an Israelite. The same high standard of care for him was to be maintained regardless as to who he had sold himself off to. This was a specific obligation, carefully recorded to avoid any chance of it being dismissed by the people. This is now the last time that this word perek or rigor is going to be seen all the way until the book of Ezekiel, where it will be seen just one more time. As the Israelite had been redeemed by the Lord, the cruelty which the Lord would face for man's full redemption is to be excluded from the treatment of the enslaved Israelite. 
the Lord took upon himself what he will not allow in those he redeemed in the process. Verse 54, and if he is not redeemed in these years, then he shall be released in the year of Jubilee, he and his children with him. The word years here is not in the original. It simply says, and if he is not redeemed in these. It is not referring to the years before the Jubilee, but of the process of being redeemed by another as well. Be careful when you read Bible translations, especially when they have inserted words. They're not always correct. Regardless as to whether he was redeemed by man or in a set period, he had been redeemed by the Lord, and he was to be released as the Lord's property in the year of Jubilee. And then it adds in a note of exceptional grace, he and his children with him. The Israelite belonged to the Lord, and those who issued from him did as well. The master could not claim that because they may have been born in his house that they were his property. Rather, they were by blood and thus by right children of Israel, and therefore by extension children of the Lord. Remember, the Hebrew slave could keep the wife and the children if they were born in the house or given to him as a wife. That's not the case with the foreigner. And so you can see that the Lord is caring for his redeemed people. Verse 55, for the children of Israel are my servants to me, and they are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. In type, we are to look at these words and we are to insert ourselves into what they merely picture. The Lord redeemed Israel out of Egypt. Christ Jesus redeemed us out of the bondage to sin and the yoke of the devil. In this, we belong to Christ and we are now his servants. He did the work. We are to be obedient to the calling. To mistreat another Christian is a self-defeating prospect. The Lord has given our instructions and to not pay heed to his word is to only violate his word and to grieve his spirit. Paul explains this for us in Ephesians. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. As with Israel, so with the church. And the reason for these things centers on one overarching concept. Verse 55 finishes with these words, I am the Lord your God. Ani Yehovah Elohechem. I am Yehovah your God. The Lord proclaims his name and his position. In essence, what we are being told with these words is, I am the self-existing creator and I am your redeemer. You are my possession and I am your God. I am Yehovah your God. You are my redeemed. Treat one another well. Watch out for one another and do so with zeal as you await the final blast of the trumpet on that great day of Jubilee. In the final analysis of what has been seen here in Leviticus chapter 25, the highest and greatest significance of the year of Jubilee is to be found in the restoration of all things, which Peter refers to in Acts chapter 3. It is the restoration of the kingdom of God, which has been, through man's disobedience and fall, left unrealized until this day and continuing in this day. Israel's 50-year jubilee was a call to restore what was originally given, to free the captive, and to reflect that which was originally established and blessed by God, meaning the Garden of Eden itself. We now live in anticipation of what that only pictured. We have been redeemed from spiritual Egypt, and all things have been restored in guarantee, but not yet in reality. Eden was lost but in Christ it is, and it shall be found. Our bodies grow old and die, but they shall be remade to last forever. Our wealth can be diminished or lost, but eternal gain lies just ahead. Brothers and sisters in Christ are held captive, but they shall be released. God fellowshiped with man, and he will do so once again. The kingdom of God and of his Christ is prepared, the table is set, and the final day of Jubilee is just around the corner. Let us not be discouraged with the temporary woes that we face, but let us rejoice and exult in the magnificent guarantee that we hope for. Christ has come among us, and through his work, our redemption is secured. Let the trumpet sound loudly, and let the people proclaim liberty throughout the land. May it be so, and may it be soon. What a beautiful chapter we've been given, and every single bit of it points to the work of Christ. The land is the Lord's, the people are the Lord's. We have been redeemed, and we are redeemed. 
And some of us are struggling. There may be people watching online right now that are struggling with drug addiction. They may be struggling with something that has got them in bondage. And they've already come to Christ. And they are as free as you and I are despite what they are facing in their life. Christ will bring them home to glory and he will wash away all of the pains that they have. He will take good care of their souls just as he will with you and I who may not have those problems. But we all have our own problems, don't we? We've got hip replacements coming. We've got shoulder repair coming. We've got all kinds of things coming on people here for physical bodies. We've got financial troubles in this church. We've got all kinds of things that are bringing people down. But the Lord has transcended these things and he promises to give us something so much better than this terrible life that we're living in. Even if it's good on a really good day, it's still pretty crummy because we might lose our dog that day or we might lose our, our best friend or a parent or a son or a daughter. We don't know. But thank God for Jesus Christ. Thank God for the year of Jubilee in chapter 25 of the book of Leviticus. If you've never called on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he's waiting he has offered you complete forgiveness of your sins, and there is nothing that he cannot forgive you of. Nothing. He is the Lord God Almighty, and he has shed his own blood to take away the sin It is in your life. And he proved it by coming out of the grave. The wages of sin is death, it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, he died, but he didn't die in sin. He died for sin. And by coming out of the grave, he proved, one, that he died for sin, and two, that he had no sin of his own, the Lord God Almighty. And so, please, if you've never asked him to forgive you, do it today. Be reconciled to God through Christ and know that your redemption is secured. Our closing verse comes from Isaiah 61. It's the first two verses. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Next week is Leviticus 26, 1 through 13. Good things will come. They're written down, so no need for guessings. It's entitled Promised Blessings. That'll be our 49th Leviticus sermon. Every time I said that this week, because I even say that part of the sermon out loud, my dog named Blessing goes, what? And you can see her ear go, promise blessings. And she's going to hear that a million times in the next couple of chapters or our next couple of sermons. But uh, yeah, we get in Leviticus 26 and it will be a good sermon. It'll be uplifting and happy. All the things that God has promised to Israel. But guess what? Right after verse 13 starts coming the curses. And you talk about a mournful state. You talk about something that is absolutely hard to listen to. Read that and combine it with chapter 28 of the book of Deuteronomy and then think that that actually happened to them because they turned from their Lord. And then we think of the grace that was poured out on us through Christ. And we don't have to face what they did because of Jesus. I wish they'd call on him and I wish it would be today. I have a final thought for you today on this particular chapter and this sermon. We have been redeemed and we can never, never be sold away permanently again. We are the Lord's salvation is eternal. Don't let anybody ever tell you otherwise. And if you read a commentary that sounds convincing, send it to me and I will tear it apart for you. All right? There is no such thing as loss of salvation. Jesus Christ did not die on the cross of Calvary to provide eternal insecurity for his redeemed. All right? Our poem today is called Of Masters and Slaves. And if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor, his riches he does not preserve and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him as a slave to serve. As a hired servant and a sojourner with you, he shall be and shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. And then he shall depart from you, he and his children with him as well, and he shall return to his own family. He shall return to the possession of his fathers, so to you I tell. For they are my servants whom I brought out of Egypt the land. They shall not be sold as slaves. In this you shall pay heed and understand. You shall not with rigor over him rule, but you shall fear your God. To him you shall not be cruel. And for your male and female slaves whom you may have, this I will not deny, from the nations that are around you, from them you may, male and female slaves, buy. 
Moreover, you may buy the children of the strangers who dwell among you. This is allowed to be, and their families who are with you, which they beget in your land, and they shall become your property. And you may take them as an inheritance for your children after you. It may be this way to inherit them as a possession. And they shall be your permanent slaves, as I tell you today. But regarding your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule over one another with rigor. In tender care of them, you shall dwell. Now, if a sojourner or a stranger close to you becomes rich, and one of your brethren who dwells by him, so you construe, becomes poor and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner close to you, or to a member of the stranger's family, after he is sold, he may be again redeemed. One of his brothers may redeem him, if in his eyes he is esteemed. Or his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him. Or anyone who is near to him of kin in his family may redeem him. Or if he is able, he may redeem himself again. Thus he shall reckon with him who bought him. The price of his release shall be according to the number of years from the year that he was sold to him until the year of Jubilee. It shall be for him according to the time of a hired servant. In this matter, all shall be observant. If there are still many years remaining, according to them, he shall repay the price of his redemption from the money with, with which he was bought on his redemption day. And if there remain but a few years until the year of Jubilee on that day, then he shall reckon with him, and according to his years, the price of his redemption, him he shall pay. He shall be with him as a yearly hired servant as his right, and he shall not rule with rigor over him in your sight. And if he is not redeemed in these years, then he shall be released in the year of Jubilee, he and his children with him, for the children of Israel are servants to me. They are my servants whom I brought out of Egypt the land. I am the Lord your God, and so these things you shall understand. Heavenly Father, through Christ we have been redeemed. We are your possession, and to you we belong. Our times of bondage now are to be lightly esteemed, as we sing in our hearts our final redemption song. Restoration is sure to come, and all will be restored. No longer will access to heaven be inhibited. The truth of this is recorded in your word, and in the life of Christ, this is certainly exhibited. And so, our King, we give joyful shouts to you as we await the trumpet blast to receive our heavenly due. Hallelujah. We shall say it once again. Hallelujah and amen. amen. Heavenly Father. Thank you for this beautiful chapter, which is so, so important in understanding so that we can look forward to the work of Jesus Christ and to look at the New Testament and to understand it in a way that was never possible before. I can't understand how people can stay in the New Testament all of their life and not go back and check what is actually being said because so many faulty theologies creep up because of a misapplication of your word. Jesus Christ did it all. He is the beloved. He is the son of David. He is the redeemer. He is the one who grants the inheritance. He is all of these things to us. And it's because you stepped out of the eternal realm and united with human flesh and became a man. What an act of beauty. What an act of marvel. Oh God, how wonderful you are to do these things for fallen creatures like us. Help us to live in a manner which is appropriate to this honor which has been bestowed upon us by Christ Jesus our Lord. And so it's in his beautiful name that we pray this. Amen. What a beautiful chapter. Absolutely astonishing to think about it when you put it in its proper context and you think that it's Jesus who did these things and it's us that he's looking out for. He owns the land. He owns the property. He owns all the cattle. He doesn't make any commentary about saving cattle or redeeming cattle or anything like that you know he only does it about man how much he loves us i can't even understand and why i certainly don't understand but he does we get the instruction for the lord's supper right from the bible you go to 1 corinthians chapter 11 where paul wrote these wonderful words for us for i received from the lord that which i also delivered to you that the lord jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and he would have given thanks over this. He would have said these beautiful words, Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam amotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper. And he would have blessed us as well. 
he would have said, Baruch Ata Adonai Loheinu, Melech HaOlam, Bore Peri HaGuffin. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you live around Judy? He's not here. I'm wondering if she's okay. I know she lives in here. I don't know where. That's all right. I'll send her an email. I'll make sure Ray, she's all right. Ray, sure. Who? Ray? Mm -hmm. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's so good that you asked us to get different matzah. I'm telling you, that other stuff is really plain. This is good stuff. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, you uh, heard our prayers at the beginning of this service for the people of India who are struggling, that are being persecuted so heavily, and this goes on throughout the world. we got them being persecuted in countries everywhere. Be there with your people. Be a real and ever-present help to them in their time of need. And even if it's not a physical help, because we know that this body is going to wear out or it's going to die in war or some other way, at least be there for them and let them know your presence in a spiritual way so that they can rise above the things that they're facing and to cling fast to you and not have any doubts in their, their hope and their faith in you. Lord, we just, we're so blessed in this country and you've given us so much and we just take it for granted. Help us not to do that as well, but to understand that, that we, we are just a, a day away from losing something as well. But 
even in that, you have redeemed us and you will promise us a much better time ahead no matter what happens. Thank you for that assurance. Be with us should that time come and we'll be sure to praise you as you give us strength to do so. And we'll praise you in the name of our beautiful Savior, Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen.